Far from the farm fields of Iowa and Missouri, elected officials, agency leaders, and concerned citizens come together in Washington, D.C. to work on policy that affects the lives of everyone in our country, including those of us out here in the heartland. On this episode of Prairie Prophets, we are in our nation's capital to meet with members of Congress to discuss Horizon 2. We catch up with some colleagues and attend the annual DC gathering of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. We took the story of Horizon 2 to Washington, and now we're showing Washington to you. Out here in the heartland, where agriculture drives rural economy, we are on the path to a future that not only produces food, but also renewable energy, ecological services, and improved wildlife habitats. I'm on a journey to tell the stories of Horizon 2, a climate smart future for corn, soybean, livestock, and renewable natural gas production. I'm Brandon Butler, and this is Prairie Profits. As the sun begins to rise over Washington, D.C., our nation's capital comes to life. It is here, far from the agricultural fields of the Midwest, where policy is set affecting agriculture, conservation, and renewable energy across our country. Here in D.C. and in state houses throughout our nation, lawmakers and those leading our agencies will work to build bridges to hopefully set a climate smart future for these United States. Washington DC has a different feel. In many ways, it's the center of our global community. The history is powerful. The monuments are humbling. The energy is infectious. We are meeting up with Bruce Knight former chief of the Natural Resources Conservation Service and current conservation consultant who is assisting with the Horizon 2 initiative. So how long have you been living up here in Washington? I came to the D.C. area in 1985, so it's been a a few years. I've always kept uh, one foot in the uh, ranch operation in South Dakota, though, as well, so I commute back and forth every six weeks or so. I'm back to so if you have this ranch in South Dakota, in God's country, yeah. what draws you back to working in Washington, D.C.? I've been, been working in the policy arena, uh, it seems like, all my life. And, and this is the place you, you do policy. And what, what is it about working in policy that is so exciting? Oh, it's, it's a chance of taking a conservation objective, something that I see that's really important on the ground anywhere in the country and making sure that it's available other parts of the country or making sure that it's available on a national platform. It's, it's a, I'm always looking for that, that bit of conservation brilliance that occurs here. How do I transfer and making sure it's over here and working as well? But a lot of that brilliance is really nothing more than staying out of nature's way. You know, one of the toughest things in the consulting business is is telling folks that sometimes you just need to let a little time evolve and work. In conservation, a lot of folks look for a, for a quick fix. I try to look for a sustainable long-term fix, something that can be put in place that will work this year, next year, and a decade from now, and stay active and in place for a decade. So for the farmer in Iowa, the farmer in Missouri or Illinois, who feels so disconnected from Washington, D.C. and the policy-making process, like what would you say to them about the work that's being done here to affect their life there? Don't get caught up too much in the cynical nature of people's views of government or the latest on, on the news on uh, government ineptitude. 
most of those government officials really want to work well for you and serve your needs as a as their constituent. Um, most people want you as a farmer or rancher to succeed. So when you go into a USDA agency, whether it's Farm Service Agency or NRCS, they, they genuinely want to help you. Um, sometimes you have to be a little insistent. Sometimes you need to ask politely, but they're, they're very much there to serve you and serve your needs and help you achieve your conservation objectives. The small working farmer earns his living on the land. He works the soil to feed and clothe this country and he buys much of the nation's goods. One fourth of the American people live by the land. The small farmer has a big stake in the life of America. Congress has been working for our nation's farmers since the founding fathers first put feather pens to paper. Agriculture is more than just business. It's the beginning of the supply chain for life, which conservation then sustains. Agriculture and conservation deserve and receive a lot of attention on Capitol Hill. The future of farming relies on policy created in Washington, D.C. In the Midwest, people are aware of what USDA is and maybe NRCS, but they're pretty disconnected from what goes on with policymaking in Washington, D.C. Well, when I first started working in public policy, 1980s, 1985 Farm Bill, that Farm Bill determined whether or not many farmers were going to be able to farm another year because we're in the middle of a farm crisis and that legislation was vital for, the, for just being able to get to the next year. Sometimes farmers think of that as what they expect from the federal role. Um, but 1987, we created and launched something called the Federal Crop Insurance Program, which has provided risk management tools for a large number of farmers and ranchers and allows farmers to offload the risk associated with multi-million dollar operations. It's hugely important. I've specialized in the, uh, in the conservation work, which is many times authorized through the various editions of the Farm Bill. And that conservation work, those tools that are delivered by both the Natural Resources Conservation Service and by FSA, have been growing and expanding in size, in scope, and in nature. So uh, what is now the Natural Resources Conservation Service used to be the Soil Conservation Service it was primarily focused just on soil conservation. Now it's soil, water, energy, and with the current push, climate change as well. And so the conservation work has gotten broader, more comprehensive, more holistic for many of those farmers, and unfortunately, a little more complicated as well. Horizon 2 is the Climate Smart Commodities Grant that is fueling prairie profits. Mm -hmm. We've got a collection of 14 different partners, universities, agencies, organizations, corporations, all coming together to work on this initiative of prairie restoration and cover crops being digested into renewable natural gas. It seems like something that just a few years ago would have been unacceptable. But today, we're moving forward under this grant, along with a number of other really unique, really exciting programs that are trying to move agriculture towards some climate smart activities. What do you think the future of agriculture looks like 10, 20, 30 years down the road? The future of agriculture is so bright and the technological changes are coming at such a rapid pace. It is really hard to predict, but I see the movement around precision agriculture that is widespread today now becoming precision conservation, where instead of conserving our natural resources 
by the acre and by the field. We're going to be able to do it by the foot and by the inch. What Bruce is describing mimics what Rudy Raceline has been preaching and implementing on his farm for the last decade. Rudy's dream of Horizon 2 has become a reality, and we are now working to deliver those solutions. The American Biogas Council is a strong supporter of Horizon 2. We're meeting with Patrick Surfass, the organization's CEO, to learn more about ABC efforts here on the Hill. Patrick, what is the American Biogas Council? Well, the American Biogas Council is the trade association that represents the whole biogas industry in the U.S. So we were formed because we want to build more biogas systems, and more specifically, the companies that build biogas systems, especially anaerobic digesters, had no representation on Capitol Hill here in Washington, D.C., or politically, and no organizing power to help uh, magnify their voices. And so 13 years ago, we had about 20 companies come to me and say, hey, will you create a trade association to help represent the anaerobic digester industry? And I said yes, and we created the American Biogas Council. And so while our catalyst was on representing the anaerobic digester sector, the American Biogas Council represents all sources of biogas, which means all projects that produce biogas, recycling organic material, making renewable energy, and recycling nutrients. How is agriculture involved in the biogas industry? Well, agriculture, uh, has organic waste. And, uh, or I guess, you know, especially in agriculture, we wouldn't even call it waste, right? We'd call it, we'd call it an organic material. And what I'm talking about is the manure. I'm talking about, uh, you know, even outside the farm, the waste materials from processing animals or even processing the food. I was talking with some guys just yesterday about uh, they sell food processing, manuf food processing equipment. And, you know, they've got, you've got waste there. And then you've got to clean all the equipment. And so you've got the waste water from that too. And so all of that material is happening, is, is being produced in the agricultural space, but it's a resource if it can be used. And that's where biogas systems come in. If you can utilize those resources that are sometimes considered waste, now we're doing some really beneficial things and there's a chance to make some money while you're doing that and doing things that protect the environment. The renewable energy industry as a whole is growing exponentially. And I think the general public is pretty aware of solar power and wind power. But when I talk to people on the streets, they don't know very much about biogas. What do we need to do as an industry to inform the public about the importance of this renewable energy source? I think we have to make, make biogas relatable to people. And it's not going to be relatable on its own, even though it is related to every one of us, because we all produce the waste that should be recycled in biogas systems. I produce wastewater when I flush the toilet and put stuff down my sink, right? I eat, I eat food that comes from farms that has organic material. I produce food waste as much as we try not to in my house. We all are related. But I think the way that we connect with the public is getting them to care about food waste. Because food waste is something that everyone sees and as you throw away or, or dispose of your food waste, that's also money that you're throwing out the door as well. And everyone, I think, can relate to that. If we get people to care about recycling food waste the way a lot of people care about recycling glass, metal, paper, and plastics, then people hopefully will ask, well, how do you recycle the food waste? Where does it go? And that's when you'll learn about biogas systems. There's only two ways to recycle food waste or organic material, biogas systems and composting systems. And they both work well together. As new feedstocks emerge, like the prairie grasses and cover crops produced through Horizon 2, biogas is going to continue to expand as a source of renewable energy. Congresswoman Miller Meeks represents the first district in Iowa. Her district is home to the first Horizon 2 digester at Seavers Family Farms. In a proud dad moment, my daughter, Annabelle, joins me to visit with the congresswoman in her office. 
it was a special experience for a high school student and her father. Congresswoman, thank you very much for your time today. You've been able to tour Brian Sievers' farm. Can you talk about how technology is becoming more important in agricultural advancements? Well, when you think about a farm at the turn of the century being 100 acres or less, uh, plowing uh, behind a horse in a field or plowing manually, that has dramatically changed. We now have the ability to have sustainable and regenerative agriculture. So using technology, we're using less pun uh, pesticide, less fungicide, less fertilizer. We have precision ag, which can deliver directly to uh, the, uh, the base of a plant. Uh, and so you have less in water runoff, which helps with water quality, but then also uh, manure, if you grow livestock, using manure to be able to create energy, energy that then can be used to go into other resources, reduce uh, the um, bacteria that are in manure that can then be applied to the crops and also reducing the odor. Uh, there's a closed loop operation that Brian Sievers has on his farm, which allows them to use solar, wind, manure as sources of energy, sell some of that energy back to the grid, but then also go back into planting both corn, soybeans, and cover crops, which has a closed loop operation. So it's an amazing thing that we're doing with technology to have regenerative, sustainable agriculture and to improve our environment. Can you talk about the importance of agriculture and conservation working hand in hand? Well, I think most of us would realize that farmers, because they make their living from the land, are our first conservationists. So for them to be able to have uh, important uh, land quality, land uh, nutrients within the land and the soil, uh, those uh, things are extraordinarily important to our farmers. Uh, to be able to have uh, crops that we uh, know through Norm Borlaug and Iowa State University as, other, as well as other uh, research institutions, to be able to uh, grow crops that are more drought tolerant, they're more um, resistant to borers or worms, you know, that allows us to increase our productivity and to grow more uh, crops on less land and also to use less pesticide, fungicide, I'm combining those two together, but to use less of those things which improve our water quality. So I think uh, our research, development, and technology has allowed us to go far beyond where we were in the past. Can you briefly talk about the importance of the policy work that's done here in Washington and how it affects farmers back in the Midwest? Well, I think one of the things that we're doing right in Iowa is that when it comes to water quality and improving water quality, we're doing that with our farmers. So they're invested and involved in the process. And too often, people in Washington, D.C. are making des decisions that affects everybody's everyday life, the things that they do daily within their life, without any realization of how that regulation impacts their life. And so you have to look at both the intended consequences of the regulation you're trying to enact, as well as the unintended consequences. So I think the most important thing that I do is go back to Iowa, talk with people, tour farms, meet with, I was just at our uh, Farm Bureau uh, dinners uh, throughout August, and then yesterday met with the Iowa Farm Bureau Association. So to be able to uh, speak with them, to understand the impact of policies you create on them, and then how we can create smarter policy to help us all achieve the same goal, which is feeding and fueling the world and doing so in a responsible environmental manner that protects our land, our soil, and our water. I think the best way to do that is in this collaborative effort that we have. There is strength in numbers, in Washington, D.C. especially. Conservation has the numbers. A big reason why is because of the work of Jeff Crane and the team at the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. We attend the organization's annual D.C. event to connect with congressional leaders about conservation. We catch up with old friends and celebrate a few individuals receiving very well-deserved awards. Well, I, I grew up kind of right where the hardwood forests of the Ozarks met the grasslands. And I grew up seeing the incredible wildlife that all of, the, um, all of those grasslands sustained. I mean, I remember prairie chickens flying across the gravel road on my way home after school. And if there's one system that we've lost way too much of, it's our grasslands. And we have to think about restoration, uh, what we can get back, how we protect that wildlife, 
So many grassland birds are in decline right now, even things like meadow larks and, uh, and night hawks. And th those are like, that's the wildlife that I grew up with. So I don't want to see that go away. And we've figured out, as you all know, that grasslands are an amazing carbon sink too. So there's lots of reasons to protect our grasslands. Now you're a dedicated conservationist. How does that translate to your work here in Washington, DC? I think it just grounds you in these systems and it's not a theoretical thing. You, you see what's happening on the ground. You see the changes. Um, and you see the, the, the wins when we do the right thing, when we make sure we have dedicated funding, when we have smart policy, um, but you also see the things that are changing that we need to address. And, and certainly, uh, you know, grassland birds is one that's near and dear to my heart that I think we can do a lot better job uh, making sure that those species are around forever. We're on the right track to a more sustainable planet. The story of Horizon 2 is spreading. Sportsmen, farmers, renewable energy advocates, we're all after the same thing. A wiser, healthier, more economically prosperous future. We're on the right track to a more sustainable planet. I remember when I, when I bought my, uh, my first tract of land, and the thing my, my father told me was, uh, Bruce, uh, you don't really own this land. You're just taking care of it while you're on this planet. And your job is to leave it in better condition than when you got it. And uh, I've tried to embrace that both in the public policy footprint and on the land that I've been blessed to own and operate. There is a long and rich history of agriculture and conservation policy in Washington, D.C. Yesterday's farmers wouldn't believe what we're working on today with Horizon 2. But the best is yet to come. We're sitting at the feet of the greatest conservation president our nation has ever known. As we work on Horizon 2, to bring more sustainable practices to agriculture, to restore prairie to lands where it belongs, to improve life for residents of rural America, I have to think my hero, Theodore Roosevelt, would be proud. Collectively, through the efforts of citizens from coast to coast and in the heartland, we will deliver climate-smart solutions for agriculture across this country.